Good morning. Today's scripture reading continues in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 1 through 7. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found, because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. All right, church. <clears throat> Would it be tacky of me to say, the weather outside is frightful, <laughs> but the gathering of the church is so delightful. Let's take our Bibles and let's turn to the passage that Anthony just read, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 7. We're continuing through this book of Hebrews, and we come today to one of the most memorable, recognizable parts of this book for Christians. There's probably nothing more recognizable for most Christians in Hebrews and Hebrews 7, the so-called Hall of Faith. And we're going to dip our toe into this chapter today by looking at the first seven verses of this great chapter. Before we get into it, I just want to kind of let you know about the context of what's taking place here and how this chapter transitions from what has been talked about already. I want to make two points, and then we'll get into our text today. I want to say this. First, this chapter is significant because it comes on the heels of one of the most terrifying warning passages in the Bible, Hebrews 10, 26 through 39. That is a disconcerting passage of Scripture. Last week, we all were warned. And what that passage teaches is that within the church, within our ranks, there will be some who are truly unconverted. Some will love their sin more than they love Christ and apostatize. That's what the author of Hebrews talks about. And the true nature of saving faith is what you might call a finishing faith. That's the author's nod to Habakkuk 2 verse 4. The righteous one shall live by faith and not shrink back. That was the end of chapter 10. And that's because saving faith is finishing faith. Y'all with me? Let's turn your neighbor right now and say, saving faith is finishing faith. We call this the perseverance of the saints. So when the author says at the end of that warning passage in verse 39, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith, who preserve their souls, you can almost anticipate the, the question asked by the readers. Can you give us some examples of this finishing faith of those who preserve their soul through faith, to which the author of Hebrews writes a full chapter giving all of these examples of these kinds of saints who preserved their soul and had saving faith. The other question, the other thing I want to address just in terms of context is we're dealing with Christian Jews that the author of Hebrews is writing to. And, you know, I can anticipate them saying something like this. What about the Jews of old? What, what about the Old Testament patriarchs and matriarchs? What about our ancestors? How did they save their soul? And it's not an accident that this author in chapter 11, he doesn't use Peter, James, and John to talk about faith. He doesn't use the examples in the book of Acts to speak about faith. 
This, argue, this author knows how to argue his point, and so he goes to the Old Testament to show that faith, that saving faith was always part of God's plan. Let me say it this way. Sola fide was not a New Testament invention. That's the way it always worked for the people of God. When Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that's not novelty. That's how it worked in the Old Testament era too. God always saved his people by faith. And just to prove that point, if you've got Hebrews 11 open, just, just look at the refrain throughout this chapter. By faith in verse 3. Everybody see that? By faith, Abel in verse 4. Everybody see that? By faith, Enoch in verse 5. By faith, Noah in verse 7. By faith, Abraham in verse 8. Nineteen times that statement is used throughout this chapter. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. You think there's a point of emphasis here? Nineteen times with 16 Old Testament characters, men and women, both. This verse-by-verse -verse fellowship is the great chapter of Hebrews 11, and we're going to look at it. We're going to look at it today. Let's get into it. Here's your outline for today. I want to ask and answer these three questions from the passage. Let's start with this one. What is saving faith that pleases God? What is that? Why all this emphasis on faith in Hebrews 11, in, in the Bible even? Why is this so central to Christian theology and to the Christian faith? Why aren't good deeds central to Christianity like the other religions of the world? Well, here's why. Look at what the author says in verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance or the certitude. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Let me direct your attention to two words here in this first sentence, this first verse. That word assurance is key. You need to understand that word and also conviction. Let's talk about assurance first. Faith is the assurance. Here's the Greek word on the screen. Faith is the hypostasis, which means trust or confidence or being sure. Faith is the assurance, the confidence, the certitude. The, you might say it this way, the confident assurance, the confident assurance of things that we hope for. What do we hope for as Christians? We hope in God's promises. We hope in the fulfillment of God's word. And we put our faith in the things that God has promised us. And that, there's a certitude in there, in that. There's an assurance in that. This is absolutely central to our Christian faith. Faith in God's word. Pastor Tony, I believe that God's going to give me a Cadillac. I believe that God's going to give me a house in the Hamptons. Okay, well... Where is the promise for that? You can hope. You know, I believe. I believe. Ah, I'm trying really hard. You can believe that all day long. That is not what the Bible teaches. God hasn't promised you that. That's not biblical faith. You know what that is? Honestly, that's superstition is what that is. I'm just going to believe in my belief. What is that? That's a false hope built on an absent promise, and therefore you have a false faith. Some of you might respond, Pastor Tony, I believe that God saves me from my sin through Christ's death on the cross. Okay, now you got something. Now we're talking about God's word. Now we're talking about God's promises. Now you've got a good hope built on a true promise, and therefore you have a sound faith. Everybody with me? Pastor Tony, I believe I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Philippians 4.13. So I'm going to play professional football. Even though I weigh 150 pounds and I don't have any athletic ability. I believe it. Mm, I really believe it. Look, Philippians 4.13 has to do with suffering. That is a false hope built on an absent promise, and therefore you have a false faith. The context of Philippians 4.13 is about suffering. And what Paul is saying in that passage is that God will help you through all suffering in Christ who gives you strength. Y'all with me? So you've got a faulty understanding of God's word that you're putting some kind of manufactured faith upon. We were talking about this once in a production meeting, and I think Kyle showed me this coffee mug that said, I can do all things through this verse that is taken out of context. 
Look, Philippians 4.13 is not a blank check for you to believe any crazy thing you want to believe. And then, you know, speak it into existence. Pastor Tony, you might say, I believe that Jesus is coming back for me. Okay, now, now we're working with something. I believe that I will receive a new resurrection body like Jesus is. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15. Now you're working with something. And I will live with him in eternity in a sinless, permanent state. I believe that, Pastor Tony. I believe that too. The Bible clearly teaches that. That's, look, that is true faith, sound faith, because it's based upon God's promises, and you can put your hope in that. You all with me? This is really important because people misunderstand faith in our day. They just think faith is some feeling, you know, just some kind of random thing. No, Martin Luther said once that faith is nothing else than clinging to the Word of God. That's what biblical faith is. You cling to God's Word. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, but it's also conviction. Look at the backside of verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things seen or not seen. What does your Bible say? Not seen with these eyes. Remember John 20? Remember what Jesus said to Thomas? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You know, Jesus showed Thomas his scars. He allowed Thomas to touch them. Remember, remember how cynical Thomas was? The apostles came to Thomas and they said, Jesus is alive. And he said, I won't believe it, not until I see it with my own eyes. Jesus was merciful to Thomas. He was good to Thomas, and he allowed him to see the scars with his eyes and to touch them even. Let me just be straight with you about this. Jesus hasn't promised you that. I'm not going to believe until I see it with my own eyes. Look, that's not how biblical faith works. That's not, none of us, none of us have the privilege that Thomas and Peter and John and Mary Magdalene had in John chapter 20. They were unique in that way. That's why the apostles saw it and wrote it down for us to believe. And that's why Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen with these eyes and yet believe. And that's why John follows up in verse 31 of chapter 20 with this statement. These things are written so that you may believe. And in other words, You know, before that, John's like, there's so much Jesus did, I couldn't write it all down. But I've curated all the things that happened in Jesus' life, and I've written it down here. Why? So that you might believe. These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John wrote that down so that we might believe. The Apostle Paul says this. He said, we walk by faith, not by sight, not by seeing said, so we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are always away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, knowing that someday we'll receive a new resurrection body. This is how Christians get saved. This is how Christians live their lives. This is how Christians anticipate the future. This is the Christian faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Some of you might say, seeing is believing, Pastor Tony. No, seeing is seeing. Biblical faith is not seeing and yet believing because belief has to do with God's word. Words are spoken and heard. That's the nature of a a word. We believe what God has revealed in his word. Faith is the conviction of things not seen, but we've heard and we believe. And that gives us some inappropriate guardrails. You know, we don't this is so important. I think our, our world just gets this confused so easily because we live, we live in a Peter Pan world. Y'all know what I mean by that? I believe I can fly. You know, if I just muster it up and then I get transported off to some, I don't know, never, never land where boys never grow up. I don't know what that is. That's silly. You haven't been promised that you can fly. So so don't, that's not biblical faith, believing just some unbelievable thing. Biblical faith is believing the sure promises of God's word and taking it to heart. Y'all with me? Am I not animated enough for y'all this morning? 
Here's what Martin Luther said about it. He said this about the patriarch Abraham. And we can learn this from the Old Testament saints. Abraham went out without the knowledge of where he was going. He, he, he had nowhere. He had no knowledge of what he was doing. You know what he had? He had the word of God and he had faith. God said, go, and he said, let's go. That's all he had. All Abraham had was the bare word of God to drive him, and he put his faith in that word, and that's what we put our faith in too, and to God's revealed word. And by the way, look at verse 2, talking about Abraham and the men of old. For by it, verse 2, the people of old received their commendation. What's the it in that verse? For by it, faith. For by faith, the people of old received their commendation. The Old Testament saints, let's just be clear about this, because I think sometimes, especially those of y'all who grew up in a Sunday school environment where everything is moralized, and it's like, be like David, he was so courageous. Be like this guy, because he was so good. And don't be like that guy, because he was so bad. That's not really what the Old Testament is meant to teach us. And Hebrews 11 is a corrective for that. Okay, the, Old, the Old Testament saints here, they're not, they're not commended for their resourcefulness, okay? The Old Testament saints in this list, they're not commended for their self-sufficiency and their rugged individualism. They're not commended for their can-do attitude. What are they commended for? Their faith in God and his word. That's what's significant, and that's what transfers into the New Testament concept of faith in the finished work of Christ. And by the way, I'll just say this too. You know, with the Hall of Faith, all these characters that we're going to look at, all of these men and women had their failures. All of them had foibles. And some of these people had massive character flaws. I mean, just look... Samson is in this list. Samson, that knucklehead from the Old Testament. Why is he here? Because he had faith, because he finished in faith, and by his faith he received commendation. Go ahead and write this down as a second question. So that's that's saving faith that pleases God. And here we have an example in verse 3 of God-pleasing faith. And, and before the author of Hebrews gets to the Old Testament characters, it's interesting. He, he actually uses one of the only occurrences of the first-person plural in this whole chapter. Because it's not by faith Abel at first, or by faith Abraham, or by faith Noah. Look at verse 3. What, what's the first thing that's said? By faith we, us. So not by faith this guy or that gal, we'll get to that later, that's 16 times, but but here first in verse 3, it's by faith we. We what? We understand that the universe was created by the Word of God, so that what is seen is not made out of the things that are visible. Now this is, stay with me here, there's a complex argument in this and there's a simple argument. Okay, I'll give you the simple argument first. How do we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God? Well, it's as simple as this. The Bible told me so. And I wish that was enough, honestly, for most people. It should be enough. How easy is that? The Bible said so. Genesis 1. But but let's deal with the complexity of what's being stated here. Because theologians make a distinction between what's called general revelation and special revelation. I've touched on this already, but I want to clarify this. General revelation involves those things that God reveals to everyone in the world. Whether you're a believer, whether you're someone who fears God or not, everybody can make certain deductions based upon general revelation that God exists. I'll give you an example. We see a tree. I didn't make that tree. You didn't make that tree. It wasn't made in some scientist's test tube. Somebody created that tree. There must be a creator. That's just, you know, basic deduction. And you can do that with a tree. 
Or you can do that with planets and stars or with the subatomic particles like atoms or quarks or molecules. All of the created things in this world point to the fact that there's a God, there's a God, there's a God, there's a God, there's a God. There's a creator. Aristotle called this God the unmoved mover. There must be something out there that moved everything else. That, I mean, and to be honest, you don't really need faith for that. I mean, that's just empirical evidence. I mean, you actually need, you need a lot of convincing yourself that, that there's not a God. That takes more work than believing that there's a God. You know, and that's why the Bible says, a fool says in her heart that there is no God. It's easy to deduce the existence of God from creation. You know, the astronomers of old used to say that an undevout astronomer is mad. How can you look out on the stars and not believe in God? You must be crazy. You don't need faith to believe in God. Now, here's what you need faith for. And this is where it, it gets narrowed in verse 3. You need faith to understand that the universe was created by the word of God. Everybody see that? This is what we call special revelation. Not just general, not just something everybody could know, but, but we, is revealed to us by God and his word. The most significant piece of special revelation is the Scripture. And without the Bible, you know, we could surmise that God created the world, but we wouldn't know who that God is or how He created. Maybe, maybe He used His cosmic hands and a cosmic protractor and cosmic architectural drawings to put together the world through millions and billions of years of His, his labor. But, but we know from the Bible, what does the Bible say? Does the Bible speak of God's cosmic protractor? No. God said, let there be light, and there was light. He spoke it into existence. God said, let there be planets. God said, let there be fish and birds and people. And God created things ex nihilo, out of nothing. That's how God created the world. And that's what the Bible teaches. By faith... Faith in the scriptures, Genesis 1, right? Verse 3, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. He spoke it into existence so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. It was an invisible God that created the visible world that we see. And that's not just Genesis 1. I mean, that's all throughout the Old Testament, including the Psalms. Psalm 32 says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By his word and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts, for he spoke and it came to be. We know that God didn't create the universe with his cosmic hands or with cosmic instruments because, because of special revelation, because of what the Bible teaches, that what is seen is made out of that which is unseen. His invisible word did this. And we believe the written word of God, Genesis 1, Psalm 32, John 1, elsewhere, we believe that which is heard and read and received as special revelation in the Bible. You all with me? And let me clarify this as well, since we're talking about faith, that's the broad topic here. Our faith in God, our understanding here, by faith we understand, is not some, you know, random leap in the dark. Y'all know how it's described like that? Like, like, here's the analogy I'll use. Like Indiana Jones, you know? Just some, some blind step into the chasm. That, when people talk, Christians talk like that all the time. It's just a blind leap in the dark. Just take that. That is cringe-inducing to me. We, there is no blind leap in the dark. Yeah, it's blind in the sense that we don't see, but, but it's not some stupid jump irrationally. No, it's based upon what we hear. It's based upon what we read. It's, it's based upon what God has revealed to us in his word. Y'all with me? If I beat this horse significantly dead. So get Indiana Jones out of your mind. And get Peter Pan out of your mind. 
Let me give you some better things to think about, some better people to think about. I'll give you three this morning from the Hall of Faith. First, write this down, this third question. How did the people of old exhibit this kind of faith? How did the people of old exhibit this kind of God-pleasing faith? Just go back for a second to verse 2. In Hebrews 11, verse 2, the Greek word for people of old is this Greek word presbyteros. And we typically use this word, or we see it in the New Testament, when the, the office of elders is being described, the presbyteroi, those elders who lead the church. I talked about this on Wednesday night when I was preaching on James and the elders coming forward to lay hands on those who are sick. But the author of Hebrews is using this word differently to refer to Old Testament saints. So that word has some flexibility there. And when I, when I say Old Testament saints, I mean the, the patriarchs and the matriarchs of the Israelites recorded in the Scripture. These people of old exhibit a kind of faith that we should emulate. So I'll give you three today. First of all, there's the faithful and fateful Abel. Secondly, there's the cryptic Enoch. And then there's Noah, famous Noah. Let's start with Abel. And by the way, these are the first three of 16. And if you track their progression throughout Hebrews 11, it's chronological. And these first three are what you call antediluvian saints, meaning they preceded the flood. And then the author of Hebrews moves from those who come after the flood. But let's start with those before the flood, and we'll talk about Abel. Abel was the second-born son of Adam and Eve, second-born person in the world. He was a sheep herder. He gave himself to animal husbandry. In Texan terms, you might call him the first cowboy. Boy, that was bad, sorry. Sorry. Abel had an older brother. His name was Cain. And Cain gave himself to working the ground as a farmer. And when it came time, so here's, here's what's significant in their story. When it came time for them to give a sacrifice to God, Abel brought the best of his flocks to the Lord. Cain brought some of his produce. And for whatever reason, God received Abel's sacrifice and rejected Cain's. Y'all know this story. Now, I think this is important to know. God's rejection of Cain's sacrifice, it wasn't a permanent indictment on Cain. Not yet, anyway. But it was an affirmation of Abel's sacrifice. Abel's sacrifice was better. It was better. It was acceptable to the Lord. Here's how the author of Hebrews says it in verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain through which he was commended, there's that word commended again, as righteous, huh, righteousness. God commended him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. How did Abel die? Well, he was killed by his brother Cain. It was the first murder recorded in the Bible. You know, as you read the book of Genesis, things are spiraling out of control after Adam and Eve's sin. And the, the truest, most gripping example of that is that one of their sons kills their other son. And, and now this, this avalanche of consequences as a result of their sin is just coming down on humanity. It's interesting as well as you read the, the account of Cain in the book of Genesis. You know, God told Cain after this unacceptable sacrifice, he said, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door its desire is contrary to you. It wants to have you, but you must rule over it. God told Cain. So God tried to talk some sense into Cain, but it didn't work. It didn't work. Interestingly, Eve had been talked into sin by Satan, but Eve's son, Cain, couldn't be talked out of sin by God. The corrupting effects of sin were just increasingly taking effect on our world. But but this isn't really about Cain in Hebrews 11. This, this is about Abel. 
This is about a man who doesn't speak a word in the Bible. Not a word. And yet, he gave an acceptable sacrifice. He's the first in this list of people that we should emulate. And we don't know anything about him other than the fact that he offered an acceptable sacrifice to God as a shepherd. Why was it acceptable? The theologians have written tombs on why it was acceptable uh, and why Cain's wasn't acceptable. Some think it was because it was a blood sacrifice. That's why it was acceptable. I think that's part of it. I think that's significant in this way that the blood points forward to Christ's sacrifice. Was it significant because Abel's sacrifice was more substantial than Cain's? Yes, I think that's part of it. It says clearly in Genesis that Abel offered up the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions, chapter 4, verse 4. But really, I think the issue is ultimately an issue of the heart. Abel offered up a gift in faith. God must have delivered a word to them. And Cain responded in faithlessness. Abel responded in faith. And Abel's faith made him commended as righteous before God. And notice the end of verse 4. God commending Abel by his gifts of faith. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. In other words, Abel didn't say a word in the Bible, but he's still talking. Because of his faithfulness, because of his faith, Abel is the prototype of our saving faith. Cain is the foil in this story. Cain rejected God's word. He rejected God's correction. He rejected God's warning. And his lack of faith was demonstrated in his actions. Here's another Old Testament saint for us to emulate. His name is Enoch. So there's Abel first. And then there's this mysterious guy. I mean, there's like three verses on him. Enoch. Let's talk about Enoch. Just turn with me. We don't do this all the time, but turn with me to the genealogy in Genesis chapter 5. So here's Abraham's descendants. And you go all the way down, and, and it's interesting as you see, they lived, they fathered, they died. Everybody see that pattern? Lived, fathered, died. Lived, fathered, died. Died, 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 died. Everybody died. But then there's, there's this break in that pattern. And that's in verse 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. And then Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah. So I, I think... Sounds like before he had the kid, he wasn't. And you all know, like, you have kids and you're like, boy, I better get this Christianity thing figured out after, after you have a child. <laughs> Enoch, I mean, just read it. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah. And, and just so you know, this wasn't like a flash in the pan kind of thing, like he did it for six months. 300 years he did this, walking with God. And by the way, in the Hebrew, that's, that's code for he walked in tight-knit relationship with the God of the universe. There's, there's relational capital that was built. This is, this is like Adam and Eve in the cool of the day walking with God. But now this is the post-fall era. We have a person walking with God. This is shocking. It gets even more shocking. Enoch walked with God and he fathered Methuselah 300 years. He had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Here it is again. Enoch walked with God. And he was not. The Hebrew is really fascinating. It's like one word. And nothing. It's basically what it says. And nothing. He's gone. What, what happened to him? God took him. Now, here's what's significant about Enoch. It's not significant that he lived a long time because Lots of people in Genesis 5 lived a long time. It's not significant that he fathered Methuselah. Lots of people fathered other people in Genesis 5. What's significant about Enoch, what makes him special, is that he didn't die. Because, and here's why that's significant. 
He died, he died, he died, he died, he died, he died, he died. He didn't die. And then it picks up again. He died, he died, he died, he died. I said last Wednesday that, you know, the Grim Reaper is batting a thousand, except for Elijah, who was taken up in a chariot of fire. And it, I mean, it didn't even occur to me until I was studying for this this week. Like, oh yeah, Enoch. I forgot about Enoch. How can you forget about this guy? Three people escaped death, or three groups of people, you might say, in the Bible. There's Elijah, there's Enoch, and then there's the raptured church, 1 Thessalonians 4. Everybody else, for everybody else, the grim reaper is batting a thousand. You're going to die. And let, just turn back to Hebrews. So that's the context, Genesis 5. So let's look at Hebrews 11, and let's try to make sense of what the author is saying here. So... The author of Hebrews is wrapping this genealogy and this statement about Enoch walking with God. He wraps it in a different kind of language. And he relates it to faith. And he says, by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found. <laughs> he just stopped existing on earth because God had taken him. You know, I almost get the sense that Enoch, he was so close with God. He was so tight. He, he knew God so well that God's just like, just come on up here, Enoch, you know. Just, just come on up. Why did God take him? What was the evidence of Enoch's faith? Well, the author of Hebrews tells us. Now, before he was taken up, he commended. He was commended, sorry, as having pleased God, the end of verse 5. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Everybody see that in verse 6? For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. That's easy. That's general revelation. I believe God exists. Okay, well, so do the demons. Believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You know, the Hebrew way of describing Enoch's faith is by stating that Enoch walked with God. And that, that same phraseology is used of Noah later. He walked with God. Same kind of thing with this Hebrew word malach, meaning to, to be in close-knit relationship with God. Abraham walked with God. The Israelites later were encouraged to walk with God. This is this is emblematic of faith or walking. We're walking with God. We're in relationship with God. We believe God. We're growing in our relationship with God. It's a great metaphor. The book of Psalms later speaks about the joy and prosperity associated with those who walk with God. Enoch, here's what I'm getting at. Enoch's walking with God was evidence of his profound faith. And by the way, just a point of clarification, it's not like Enoch was some monk off in a desert walking with God and didn't talk to anybody. We, we get that idea in our minds sometimes, like, oh, walking with God means like I, I go and I, I live in the monastery all alone. I stay away from sinful people. No, Jude 14 says that Enoch was a preacher of righteousness. He didn't try to escape society. He tried to reform it. And, and it's not like it was a flash in the pan, this walking. He did it for 300 years. For 300 years, he walked with God. What Enoch shows us in the post-fall world is that even in a world surrounded by sin and God defiance, even with the barriers between us and God that were erected by Adam and Eve's sin, we can still have a meaningful, loving, personal, intimate relationship with the God who created us. And if that was true for Enoch, in the pre-Christ era, how much more is it true for us? Because you know what we got on this side of the cross? We got the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We have evidence of that thing in our rearview mirror that the saints of old waited centuries for. The Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah. We've seen the Messiah. Or maybe to put it better, We've read the word about the Messiah and believed, and we anticipate his future coming. Don't we now? Without faith, look at verse 6. 
Your obedience to God has to flow from faith. You're not going to please God by being obedient. You'll never be obedient enough to outweigh your sinfulness. But your obedience that flows out of your faith in the finished work of Christ, now you got something. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Forever would draw near to God, must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And then there's a third Old Testament saint for us to emulate. Then there's Noah. Don't you love Noah? Noah, of course, lived in an exceedingly wicked time when God decided to wipe out all of humanity from the face of the earth other than Noah and his small family. Noah, by the way, was a a righteous and obedient man. The prophet Ezekiel called him righteous. The apostle Peter called Noah a preacher of righteousness who was saved in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. 1 Peter 3, 2 Peter 2. But listen, this is important because I think we make this mistake that you know God saved Noah because he was righteous. He was a good guy. Now, listen, saints. Noah's righteousness was born of faith, not the other way around. Prove it to me, Pastor Tony. Look at verse 7. By faith, not by righteousness in and of himself, Noah wasn't a good guy. In fact, Noah, I mean, he made some mistakes. But by faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet, what's your Bible say? Seen or unseen? unseen. What does that sound like? That sounds like verse one. Here we are again. Faith in things that are unseen. He's building an ark. God said there's going to be a flood. Everybody else thinks he's crazy. But he believed the word of God. He believed that which is unseen. By faith, this is the opposite of of Thomas in John 20. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That was Noah. By faith, Noah being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen in reverent fear of God constructed this, this box that floated an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world. He didn't condemn the world like going around saying, naughty, naughty, naughty little world. I mean, really, you know how you condemn the world? You condemn the world by your faith and your righteousness born out of faith. The world hates that. And when you shine light in this world, the darkness of this world sees itself as excessively dark, and they don't like that. They feel that condemnation. That's what Noah modeled for us. By this he condemned the world and became, look at this, look at the end of verse 7. You don't hear this a lot about Noah in Sunday school. He became an heir of the righteousness that comes by what? There it is again. Heir of righteousness that comes by, righteousness by faith, that sounds like Paul in the book of Romans. That sounds like Abraham, not Noah. The author of Hebrews is going to get to Abraham in just a second. Come back next week for more on that. But but let's just stay on, on Noah. Because we need to know that Abraham wasn't the only person reckoned as righteous before the Lord by his faith. Noah's faith was credited to him as righteousness too. Enoch's faith, his walking with God, was credited to him as righteousness too. Abel's faith in offering up a better sacrifice was credited to him as righteousness too. This is the way of salvation in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. We're saved by faith. Habakkuk said it this way, the righteous shall live by faith. So let me just connect the dots for you. The author of Hebrews, arguing from the Old Testament, we live in the New Testament era, Christ has come. 
Look, probably said this a thousand times already from this pulpit. You're not saved by your works, people. You're not saved by your righteousness. Yea, you have no righteousness apart from Christ. How are we saved? How, and, and let, me, let me put it even stronger than that. How are we saved in order to produce a real kind of righteousness that actually impacts the world? You're saved by faith. By faith. The righteous shall live by faith. And faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith goes two directions. We go backwards. We read, Jesus died on the cross. He rose from the dead. We believe it. Even though we haven't seen it with our eyes, we believe it. And then faith also looks forward in hope to Christ's return. But we're more like the Old Testament saints than we like to admit sometimes. They were waiting for Jesus to come. We're waiting for Jesus to come too. Come back. And our faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Right? I believe. Do y'all believe? Okay, I'll close with this. And then we can sing as an expression of our faith. Throughout my life, I'll just tell you there's been about 10 songs that have been written, sung, performed. I don't want to say this too strongly, but I'll say it this way, that have, have altered the course of my life. And I would just say that out of those 10 songs, probably six of them were written by a man named Rich Mullins who died when I was 19 years old. And some of his songs were so formative to my faith as a kid, especially as a teenager, I still can't sing them without weeping. Probably at the top of that list of 10 songs is a song called Creed, which is really nothing more than Mullins' recapitulation of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, Almighty Maker of heaven and earth, et cetera, et cetera. So I... You know, let me take you back to high school if I could for a moment. I was driving a 1989 Honda Accord. And me and my dad had just installed a JBL CD player. And it had one of those removable uh, faces, you know, so it was like a protection from security, right? Yeah, I guess. I don't know. And so I would put my Rich Mullen CD, and when the rest of the high school was listening to Stone Temple Pilots and Snoop Doggy Dog, I was listening to Rich Mullins. <laughs> and I would play those CDs, one particular CD, and I would sing this song, Creed, and the refrain that in impacts me the most is this part. This is not a part of the original Apostles' Creed, but this is Mullins' edition. He said, and I believe what I believe. It's what makes me what I am. I did not make it. No, it is making me. It is the very truth of God, not the invention of any man. So in that song, he's singing. He's singing about Christ. He's singing about the only begotten Son. He's singing about the Holy Spirit. He's singing about the church. He's singing about the crucifixion and the payment for sin. He's singing about the resurrection and life that will not end. And then comes the refrain. All of those components of the Apostles' Creed. And then he says, I believe what I believe. It's what makes me what I am. I did not make it. It's making me. It's the very truth of God, not the invention of any man. Listen, church, Christianity is a religion of faith. We believe 
in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We believe in God's holy word. Our faith is not some Peter Pan fantasy. We believe this. And that faith is going to take us right on home to eternity. So believe it. Pray with me. Lord, I believe what I believe. It's what makes me what I am. I did not make it. No, it's making me. The man that I am today the life that you have saved and transformed God you did that and I give you praise for that and Lord I know I'm not alone in this room we have a room full of believers Lord, they know that their works can't save them. And Lord, we're so grateful that in our sinfulness and our depravity and our weakness, our inability to save ourselves, Jesus, you made a way You saved us when we couldn't save ourselves. And we believe, like the saints of old, like Abel, like Enoch, like Noah, like Abraham, like Peter, like James, like John, like Paul, By faith, Lord, we are saved. And Lord, not only are we saved by faith, we walk by faith. We anticipate with confidence what's coming, your return, our eternity with you. Lord, those things are more solid and secure than the air that we breathe. You have promised them. You will bring them to pass. We believe your promises, Lord. Lord, help us to walk by faith. Help us to walk in faith. Help us to grow in faith. Help us to grow in our anticipation for your return and those future promises. I pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.